The following is an exclusive presentation of WI Garden Media, the voice of Garden Talk Radio. Coming up on the program today, it's all about debunking some very common garden myths, as well as how has the pandemic shaped the horticultural world. Our guest will be author Christy Willingham and will answer your garden questions. The hour is full, so let's start right now. You are listening to the most informationally packed hour of garden-focused radio in the country and on the internet with your host, husband and wife team Joey and Holly Baird. This is the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show. Welcome, welcome to the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show. Happy you have allowed us to be part of your day. I am your host, Joy Baird. Beside me is my wife, co-host, best friend, and gardening partner, Holly Baird. This program is for you, about you, to help your garden grow better, maintain your landscape, grow healthier trees, make your grass look greener, as well as preserving what you grow. We thank you for tuning in, whether you're listening to us on one of the 15 AM and FM frequencies that our broadcast is being, our show is being broadcasted on here in 2021. Whether you're listening through the Radio Season 5 tab at the top of our parent website, the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener.com, through a radio app or podcast replay or in studio video replay, thank you for that. If you want to be part of the program, you can certainly do that by two very common and easy avenues. One being you can send us an email to Garden Talk Radio at gmail.com, Garden Talk Radio at gmail.com. Or you can give us a call, toll-free, coast-to-coast, 1-800-927-SHOW. That's 1-800-927-SHOW, 1-800-927-7469. Big show lined up for you, so let's get into it, Holly. So what we want to cover today is... Some garden myths. Common garden myths. Some common gar- garden myths. So I think... Some of these you may have already done and didn't realize they were garden meth, but we're going to make sure you don't do them again. And some of them sound as ridiculous as they are. But people believe but them. But people believe them because maybe that was something that somebody told them once upon a time, and that's okay. So I guess the first one we have here is if you add sugar to the soil around your tomatoes, you'll grow a sweeter vegetable. That doesn't make any sense. No, it doesn't make any sense. Um, I don't. I, I don't know where that theory came from, where that myth came from, but... It doesn't make any sense. The only putting, way that that's going, the only way you're going to get a sweeter vegetable or in, in instance of tomatoes is a different type of tomato, a different variety of tomato. Typically, smaller varieties, uh, less acidic varieties are the non-red tomatoes. Putting sugar in the hole is really the invitation of uh, causing insects and rodents to uh, go into that area. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. Right. So there's no science there, essentially. Um, it's just the variety of the tomatoes. So another one is I have one earthworm. I will cut it in half, and I have two earthworms. Or if you you know, you know cut it with a shovel, um, that type of thing, whenever you're uh, working the soil. So I actually believed this when I was um, a child. And I would collect worms from when it rained, and I had a worm collection. And then my dad told me if you cut the worms in half – that they would multiply, and I, I did a little experiment, and that didn't you killed happen. a lot of worms. I killed some worms, yeah. But I had this Tupperware container just full of worms. There's no wonder why I'm a gardener today. Yeah, the uh, if you cut a worm in half, it's almost impossible not to, to, to hurt some worms. Right, because they have a circulatory system. Right. They have a brain. They have... Um, you know, all of that, they have a, what's it called, a, a waste, um, like a digestive system. So, yeah, a, you can't cut the worm in half. Uh, you, if, if you do cut one in half, uh, one part, uh, typically the, the, well, it's the end with a little bump on it. If it's not uh, too severe, it will reheal itself and continue on. The other part will rot in the ground. Now, I know a lot of people are concerned, like, when they're digging in the soil or perhaps if they're using a, a rototiller. Um, the biggest thing is that you can't prevent you you can you can prevent it, but you can't avoid it. Limit, the worms. yeah, you can limit it. I mean, if you dig in the soil with your shovel and the worm gets chopped in half, it's going to happen. When you use your rototiller, what you want to do is about I don't know what three minutes or something. Yeah, three to five before you run it or before you start to rototill, you can run it next to 
wherever you're going to run it next to the garden plot. Let it idle. Let it idle. And then what happens is worms sense danger by vibrations. They're going to go deeper in the soil. And then you don't the have smart to worry, ones. The, well, the smart ones. And you don't have to worry about it as much. So that, that's one way. Um, and you can you know do your best to avoid tilling altogether. Um, but there is more earthworms than you in healthy soil more earthworms than you could ever imagine but that's the that's the myth there and uh so your dad was wrong on that and you can uh, he he's listening and uh he will have learned something from the program right so coffee grounds will make your soil acidic and pine needles too so this is not true um coffee grounds do have a ph anywhere from 4.6 to 8.4 and we're talking about used coffee Co- grounds yeah. Um, so coffee grounds from like a local coffee shop is t- typically about a 6.8. Um, it's not going to make this soil acidic. Now, you would have to add a lot of coffee grounds. Um, the you, the but, acidity has been brewed out yeah, during the, the coffee making process. has been brewed out. But as far as like the nitrogen that's in them, if you, if you, a lot of people may be concerned about that, you'd have to add a lot, a lot of coffee grounds to your soil. Coffee grounds contain by volume about 2% nitrogen, 0.4-ish percent potassium, 0.2-ish percent phosphate. So the nitrogen is really what you're going after. Also, you're going after that organic material that you're incorporating into your garden, your grow beds, in order to uh, bring in the um, earthworms and other insects in order to feed off that and break that down to a usable form for your plants to uptake pine needles they're acidic on the um, tree about a 3.5 and but by the time they fall to the ground break down to a usable soil they have neutralized they make a very very good mulch that doesn't break down very rapidly uh, over the course of a growing season so it works very well in that aspect to utilize pine needles so You'll hear the stories, and the, and there are some very well-known, reputable Garden Talk radio hosts in this country, in the United States, that preach that coffee grounds will make your soil acidic. Pour it into your your plants that need uh, acidity in order to get them to to do to to grow better. Simply not true at all, and they're misleading millions of people each week with this kind of information. Right. So that's another myth. And then, as far as the pine needles, yeah, we we yeah, uh, pine needles aren't don't make the soil yeah. acidic at all. Um. So then, let's see here. Organic pesticides they must be safer than chemical for uh, pesticides. So, to an extent, I mean, they are safer for the environment when used correctly. When used correctly. Now, when it comes to using them improperly. Say you think, okay... It's organic. How about I use more to fix the problem because it's safe because it's organic. Right. Not the case. Right. So if one with a half a cup per 12 square feet is good, then obviously one cup is better. You don't want to do that. For one, even if it's not going to cause any problems or damage or something, you're just wasting your money, essentially, because the plants are only going to take in... It's only going to... Absorbance of the soil as much. The plants are going to take in what they need. Well, on the pesticide, uh, on the on the if you're spraying for a bug control of some sort, you know you can overutilize, and too much of an organic chemical can kill the good bugs too. Right. Well, I, the, I thought we were talking about fertilizer. Oh, fertilizer that yeah. too. Yeah, yeah, we can talk about fertilizer, organic versus uh, synthetic, as yeah, so well some, as uh, some, yeah, something like organic fertilizer. You don't need to add more because it's not like the plant's going to think. Oh, this is a great boost. It's just going to use what it needs. Right, and and with the uh, the chemicals, the bug or, or weed killer, organic means uh, using too much is just as bad as using, you know, too much of the the the, the synthetic man made stuff. So you want to read the instructions, follow the instructions. Yes, t- in some instances, the organic is not as strong or as potent as the chemical synthetic or non-organic item is but it is to some degree much more environmentally friendly because it is not of that level of toxicity that it hits the bug or it hits the planet the plant instantly falls over and, and croaks because of that high level of toxicity right so that's that's a good point so the next the next theory is that watering during the heat of the day burns the plant leaves and this is not true so the theory is is that 
the water. So you say you water at noon, and it's the hottest time of the day. Typically, th- between one and three p.m. is the hottest time of the day. So let's this is like that. if you're doing that overhead or that sprinkler, the overhead stuff. If you're going at ground level, sub irrigation, drip irrigation, soaker hose, this is not relevant to that. We're talking about overhead overhead water. Yeah. So say you do this between one and three or whatever the hottest time of the day, where the sun's at the highest peak. The theory is is that the water droplets fall on the leaves, and then the sun is there, and it burns the leaves. Well, hold on a minute. Now and it magnifies the sun. It rains all over the world, and then the sun comes out after it rains all over the world, and plants are not combusting <laughs> from water droplets. Like the trees. Yeah, <laughs> they're exploding throughout the woods. So this clearly, there, this is not the case because if it was the case, there would be no vegetation left on the earth because it all would combust because the magnification of the water and the sunlight would cause the plants to burn up. Right. So it's not true. Uh, physicists found that the water droplets on the leaf surface were not able to focus the sun's energy. So a lot of times it might be something like a lack of nutrients, reactions from over fertilization, things like that. So continue to, you know, the best option to watering is simply at ground level or in the early in the morning so the plants can dry off before the evening you know if you water right at dusk and the nighttime temperatures are not that warm that what moisture on the leaves can introduce mildew and problems for the plant so if you can invest in a irrigation system such as from drip works or water hoop or tree diaper to keep that moisture at very low to the ground and off of the leaves, your plants are going to be much healthier and you don't lose as much because of the evaporation that's flying through the air until it gets to the ground. Right. And with that, that is just some of the 400 billion and 12 different garden methods in which maybe some of you have thought for years was true. Uh, But one thing, and it's not true. So we hopefully we can avoid you to doing some extra work and focus on things that we know are scientifically proven and can make your garden grow better. Another thing that we know is true is Walton's has everything but the meat, and they have all the items you need to go from animal to edible from the animals on your property or that you purchase to take care of the product yourself. The Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show is brought to you today by our sponsor, Walton's Inc. Listen, we know you care about where your food comes from. Canning and preserving your fruits and vegetables is great. But what about the meats? At waltonsinc.com, you, you can get all the equipment, seasoning, and supplies to make sausage, jerky, and any, any other meat product your way to your high standards. Do you want snack sticks that people will actually like? Walton's created meatjustics.com, an informational site to help you make the best finished product. Walton's even has a full line of their own meat grinders, mixers, sausage stuffers, and more. Spices you and can, seasoning. Yes, yeah, spices uh, and seasoning. Spices and seasoning, even for, for your, your vegetables, too. For your vegetables and your barbecues, uh, they got the stuff that uh, surpasses anybody else's that you can find. It's definitely very delicious. So you can go from animal to edible. Walton's is everything but the meat. Again, that's waltonsinc.com or meatgistics.com. Well, when we come back, how has the pandemic shaped the horticultural world, and is it going to stay that way for a while? You're listening to The Garden with Joy and Holly Radio Show. Got a question for Joey and Holly? Send it via email anytime to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. We here at the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show Gardens understand that healthy soil is the key to a successful garden. We know that chemical fertilizer burns carbon out of the soil and kills the microbes needed for a healthy soil ecosystem. No worries. Chicken Soup for the Soil by Dr. Jim's will stimulate life into your soil, supplying all the nutrients most fertilizers neglect. Rather than force-feeding water-soluble chemical fertilizer, we suggest feeding the microbes a smorgasbord of 100% biodegradable nutrients that your plants can consume when they need them. The nutrients are readily available to maximize their genetic potential. Chicken Soup for the Soil will increase the quality of the fruit and vegetables you grow. Visit drjims.com. That's D-R-J-I-M-Z dot com. Now that your garden is in place, help your plants grow with Chapin's sprayers. Use our hose-in and handheld sprayers to feed your plants and control pests. Set up a fertilizer injector to water and feed at the same time. Cover large areas with a backpack or ATV sprayer. 
Shape and equipment is available at all major home improvement and hardware stores and online at www.chapinmfg.com. Chapin, cover more ground. Wild Delight has a complete line of premium food and treats for wild birds and other wildlife. It contains the finest ingredients you can feed your outdoor pets. Fill your bird feeders with a selection of Wild Delight's premium quality mixes to have a yard full of colorful birds. Wild Delight is filled with nuts and berries your birds will love and contains no filler ingredients such as cracked corn or milo. Feed the birds the nutrition they need. This keeps your feathered friends coming back year after year. Find out more at wilddelight.com. Deer Defeat is an all-natural repellent to keep deer, rabbits, and groundhogs away from your precious plants. Deer Defeat protects your plants day and night, dries clear, and odorless. It will not clog your sprayer. Deer Defeat works for 30 days through rain, snow, and freeze. Safe, effective, and works on rabbits. Money-back guarantee. To purchase, go to DeerDefeat.com and use code RADIO to save 10% on your order. Deer Defeat. It can't be beat. Do you know there's a real Tiger Torch? Visit TigerTorchLTD.com for more information. Rinse kit. Pressurized water on the go. No pumping, no battery. Simply fill from your spigot or sink on the way out for up to five minutes of spray time. Anywhere. Live dirty. Rinse clean with Rinse Kit. Tired of dealing with bugs but don't want to use harmful chemicals to repel them? Naturally Green, no more bugs, is all natural and plant-based. No more chemical bug repellent. Use it around your home and on you, indoors and out. Deet free and will not stain. Repels mosquitoes, ticks, fleas, roaches, ants, flies, and more. No more bugs is the answer to what is bugging you. Stop using harmful chemicals and use what is safe for you, your family, pets, and the environment. For more information, visit natgreenproducts.com. Natgreenproducts.com. You move your lawn sprinklers all over the yard, but you always end up putting them in the same spots. Why not just bury them there? Out of sight, always ready to use, pre-adjusted to water the precise areas you want. Quick Snap Sprinklers makes it easy. In-ground sprinklers without the hassle or expense of laying pipe. Put the sprinklers anywhere in your lawn or garden. Snap on a hose to supply the water. Water on, it pops up. Water off, it drops below ground. You can mow right over it. You can have a buried sprinkler system up and running in just minutes. Each Quick Snap saves thousands of dollars. They install in minutes and operate for years. Visit quicksnapsprinkler.com. Soul Brew Kombucha is founded and handcrafted in Milwaukee. 100% organic, formulated for ultimate health and enjoyment. Find out the benefits of drinking kombucha and where to purchase at mysoulbrew.com or find them on Facebook at My Soul Brew. The Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show is brought to you by the following. Simply Earth, Seed Savers Exchange, Quick Snap Sprinklers, Water Hoop, Timber Pro Coatings, Bloom and Easy Plants, Pomona Universal Pectin, Ivy Organics, Tiger Torch, Happy Leaf LED, Seed Link. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Welcome back to the Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show. Thank you for allowing us to be part of your day. Well, the heat in many parts of the country is setting in, and a drought is part of the heat. We're in a drought in uh, where we're located in many parts of the country as well, and Tree Diaper can help you keep your plants you keep your plants healthy. Tree Diaper is a revolutionary watering system that slowly releases water around the base of any tree or plant as the soil dries. The tree diaper is filled with water from rain or when you water and slowly releases water over three weeks. Every time it rains or you water, tree diaper recharges. No pipes, hoses, or electricity needed. You water your plants and trees, whether they are by the house, down the road, or in the back 40. It also works under mulch. Whether you're a first-time gardener, advanced tree diaper will improve the way you water your plants. Made in the USA, you can see all the sizes that they have available at treediaper.com. That is treediaper.com. Well, um, in 2020, in 2020 um, 16 to 18 million people started a garden for their very first time mm-hmm. due, to the, due to the pandemic because people had a lot more time on their hands. And I think people were definitely thinking about the food supply when there was um, possibly some food sh- shortages, things like that. It drew them to gardening. It was something to do, especially with their families during the times of uh, social distancing and whatnot. 
Yeah, how how has uh, the pandemic shaped the gardening or the horticultural industry? Uh, with that 18 to 20 million new gardeners, that swelled the total number of gardeners in the U.S. It's a little over past uh, 63 million, according to the CEO of Bonnie Plants. Uh, and then, and, and our listeners, maybe some of these new gardeners. Yes, uh, we were seeing and we still are seeing uh, questions and we welcome those questions to garden talk radio at gmail.com and we get the, uh, the the beginning of the email is hello i'm such and such from here and i listen to the show either on the radio or podcast this may seem like a silly question but and then the question is uh listed there's no such thing as a silly question because you know we're in the gardening i'll give an example here we're in the gardening. If I walked up to somebody who flies a plane, I'm going to ask questions that he or she would think would be a very common, ordinary, simple, everybody should know that answer to that question, question. But I don't know, so they would be respectful and say, oh, yeah, this is how that works. But here's the thing. I don't even put that much thought into it. I, somebody says... I'm having problems with the torn- tomato hornworm. Well, I know and some people just, feel like they, oh, yeah. they they feel like this is a this is just a silly question. I'm, no, I, I just yeah, yeah. I just answer it. That's because that's right. What, that's what I want to do. That's how I want to be helpful. You know, my my manager asks me questions all the time. He went from growing in a, a raised bed and had he's moving whatever. And now he's growing in pots and he had some questions. And do I think twice about his questions? Are they silly to me? Absolutely not. I just want to answer to be helpful. Well, the the interesting thing about all these gardeners is growing flowers was by far the most popular activity last year going into this year. By seven at at seventy three percent of the gardeners, they grew flowers uh, with shrubs and vegetation rounding out the top three. And then more than thirty two percent rank container gardening high on their list. House plants. Are also important. Forty six percent saying indoor gardening is meaning a meaningful activity. Right. So another thing I wanted to mention is that when people are when people started gardening last year for the first time, or returning, or returning, or maybe returning, they maybe they left the the hobby or whatever you want to call it. A lot of them, you know, not only were trying to think about their food supply, but it was something for them to do that brought them joy and it brought them kind of a sense of purpose or, or in some instances allowed them to not think about what was going on in the world detaching themselves from society for a little bit of time right and that's the thing about gardening is it really helps it essentially helps ground you you you're, you got your hands in the soil you're you're dealing with the plants you're thinking about that you're thinking about watering your plants it becomes it not that it is all consuming but it becomes something that you know it's something that it's a distraction essentially, but it's not a bad distraction. It's something that is positive and helpful. And a lot of people turn to gardening. They turn to just being outside. I saw a lot of people, extra people like on the trails and stuff. So it's it's not uncommon that this is what happened. Even like, you know, I think about Victory Gardens after World War II or during World War II and after, things like that. So it's no surprise. So now our question is, are people going to return to it? Have they returned to it? What's going on with these, with these pandemic gardens now? Well, you indicated at the beginning of the segment that 16 to 18 million new gar- uh, people started gardening last year for the first time. And the survey done, said they indicated that 86% of those people surveyed said that they would garden again in 2021. And um, uh, many of them said that they would even expand on their garden. Now, Expanding on the garden, obviously, it depends on if your ground container raised beds, uh, your financial situation with the cost of lumber. Now, uh, you can use, you know, be creative with pallet making pallet raised beds and all this. But I, we saw, we saw uh, through our platforms and other significant YouTubers and radio hosts and social media gardening platforms saw a significant spike in activity and followership, uh, following ship, I guess is the wrong word there, um, subscribership to just, just followers, followers, subscribers. yeah, to to these pages. Uh, we are starting. We we seen we've seen I think to a certain level a plateauing effect at this point because in March, in March. Um, Everything you know, we nobody with very 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 few people knew what was going on. The uncertainty. Okay, let's kind of, It's going to be kind of like last year, a, a repeat of March 2020, and then 
the world, uh, we won't get into too many words because we don't know how this is going to get censored on our social media platforms. So uh, a, a device was come out that would prevent you from potentially getting the thing and the world was getting back to quote unquote normal normalcy. And I think there's going to be a, you know, uh, movie theaters, bars, restaurants, all that has opened back up to some degree. And I think a lot of those, we're going to garden. We've never gardened before. And they tried it last year because it was nothing else to do. And now that the world has quote unquote opened back up, the plateauing effect may, we may see a downturn a little bit in the activity of backyard gardening. I don't, I don't doubt that at all. Um, I know even, even myself, I've noticed that I'm not, I mean, we're, we're gardening and stuff, but like, I'm not doing as many, uh, non, non communicable activities where I'm not, you know, staying home as much. I'm going out more, things like that. So I, it's not surprising that people are maybe abandoning their pandemic gardens, whatever, but it's not to say that they're not going to go back to them. No, it's not not that bad. But I'm just saying the, the general sense, if you had a, a million people have to stay home and, and couldn't do anything, and then all the million people that had to stay home are now given the opportunity to leave their home and go do things, not everybody's going to return to what they once were doing a year ago. However, um, you know, we see this in a couple of garden centers in our area last year. Before Memorial Day, when most of the summer crops are planted, they didn't have a plant left. Yeah, they stuff w- was just flying off. They, the they didn't have yeah. anything. And now we go there, and we're in the middle portions of June, and they have hundreds of peppers, eggplants, tomatoes, a lot of brassicas still sitting on the shelves. Because they overordered, knowing what they saw last year at this time, that they didn't have enough supply on hand. The seed companies were doing this as well. A lot of seed companies were, we were being told from our sources back in November, get your seeds early because nobody's going to have any seeds. There's going to be a seed shortage. Well, wrote it. well nobody knew what was going to happen. Right. Everybody. You was, have to make these decisions, yeah. you know, months before the planting season. But also these seed company seed savers exchange included, they had a limit of how many new orders could come in each day and then they would shut the website down. So you had to either be on top of it and get in that early window or find a kiosk somewhere or purchase seeds that you maybe weren't happy with the company in which you purchased them from, but you were just in the mindset, I have to get whatever I can get wherever I can get it from at this point because nobody else has it type of my type of thing. Well, just like everything else, you know, the pandemic has caused uh, waves of reactions. Good and, and bad. Good and bad. Uh, you know, different waves of getting supplies for certain things, what have you. So I think um, it's just it's just natural that a lot of these companies thought, let's be prepared. And there's nothing wrong with that. But it seems that, as, as it even says here, you know, about 86% of people thought, hey, I would garden again. So, and 40% of the survey in that Bonnie Plant survey said that they would uh, plant about the same, and 47% said they were going to plant more. Now, this was right. back so, in October, November, when we didn't know what was going on. Right, that's just it, is that they didn't know what was going on. But even say that 20% of those people aren't growing, so that we're at 66%, that's okay, too. And yes. it, and I don't, I don't think that there's anything wrong with that, but it's definitely interesting how the pandemic has affected the gardening world at the beginning, you know, everybody was gardening. And now it's like, we didn't things, know what to do. We didn't know what to then do. we decided, Hey, we can stay home and garden. And then we kind of kind of figured out what was going on day by day in the situations that was, it was granted to us. So, uh, you know, it, it's one of those things that we're, we're still learning. Um, and in, in, you know, we, we, there's still a large percentage of people that are guarding, but I think we, we lost those, you know, weekend, uh, let's do something to do something. And they, the, and these are the people that may have spent a, a chunk of money to garden. And then they realized, Oh, the world's back open. We don't need to garden because the grocery store has everything we need, but there was a certain level and there still is of that food insecurity and not knowing where or if, or how clean or what's going on with certain items that you enjoy. And, If you've ever grown tomatoes, for example, you know that there's nothing that ever comes close to what you pull off of your garden's vine. Um, You know, there's no such thing as a ripe tomato from the grocery store that doesn't taste like a piece of cardboard. I just also want to mention that we still live in a world that there's a lot of instant gratification. Yeah. And people may have gardened. It wasn't what they thought it was. 
not realizing that it does take some time to kind of get the hang of it. Even us veterans, we still make mistakes. And maybe, you know, that is something that could have happened to Well, turn on any TV program, not so much YouTube, but any TV program, 25 minutes, they've planted a garden, they've harvested the garden, they've canned it up, not a single problem, and you can do it too. And you can remodel your house like that too. Why? They yeah. build a whole house in a ha- in, in, right. a, in 45 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. So That, that doesn't happen. <laughs> this old house, they built a patio in, in, uh, in 15 minutes. It took me and my family back home on the farm seven days to get that sucker put together. So I don't know what happened there. We must have did something wrong. And some people romanticize hobbies. You know, this seems like a fun hobby. Let's try it. And then all of a sudden they're like, no, this is not for right. me. And that happens too. So there's there's many variables, but and we'll I guess we'll have to see what happens in 2022. But if you're gardening or um, you you're starting to garden this year because he heard of the hype, uh, it doesn't have to be big. You can start with four by four raised bed, a couple of containers, uh, just uh, dig in the ground, and you. It's not too late to start gardening. Uh, there's many gardeners uh, last year that started in July and did relatively well. So keep that in mind. But uh, as the summer is in full swing now in many portions of the country, Holly, those nasty Japanese beetles are wreaking havoc on our gardens, and we need to stop that so we can have a successful garden. Yeah, if you're looking to successfully control beetles without damaging the environment, look no further than Beetle Gone from Phylum Bioproducts, derived from a naturally occurring soil bacteria. Beetle Gone is the only organic solution that successfully controls beetle invaders. You just mix the powder and water and spray on your plants. Once ingested, the the target pests will stop feeding and die. And since it's an organic BT product, you know it's a great choice to use on your fruits and veggies in addition to your ornamental flowers and trees. Not only does Beetle Gone work, but what I like most about it, Holly, is the product that is safe for around for beneficial insects, ladybugs, butterflies, bees, doesn't affect those at all. Has no issue with water toxicity. Beetle Gone. From phylumbioproducts.com. That's P H Y L L O M bioproducts.com. Check it out. The product works and it can help your garden grow better. Well, when we come back, it's all about Christy Wheelingham and her new book about growing trees, uh, fruit trees in containers. You're listening to The Garden with Joey and Holly. Radio Have a garden show. question? Give Joey and Holly a call now or anytime 24 7. Just dial 1-800-927-SHOW. If you can't get through, leave a message and they will call you back. Call now, 1-800-927-SHOW. If you could double the life of your raised bed boxes by sealing the wood with a clear non-toxic wood preservative, would you? Well, now you can with a clear penetrating product called internal wood stabilizer. It's 100% non-toxic and easy to apply. Seal your untreated wood surfaces, even chicken coops by spraying on internal wood stabilizer. It's invisible, seals the wood from the inside out, and never wears off. Recommended by organic gardening experts, internal wood stabilizer. Check it out at TimberProCoatingsUSA.com. We've been using a game-changing tool called SeedLinked to find and review our seeds this year. It makes finding the right seeds simple. It is driven by growers' data so you can really see what's best for your location. Check it out at SeedLinked.com or download the mobile app today. The number one key to healthy, productive plants are the roots. Starting from seed to full-grown plants, RootMaker.com has the answer. From seed starting trays with an innovative design that air prunes the roots, creating a fabulous root system, never again will you have root bound plants to multiple gallon grow bag sizes to raise beds. Rootmaker.com has your grow needs covered. Visit Rootmaker.com. Use coupon code RADIO21 and get 15% off your entire order. Pomona's Universal Pectin is a high-quality pectin that gels reliably with low amounts of any sweetener. If you're trying to reduce the amount of sugar in your diet, you'll love Pomona's Universal Pectin. Now you can make healthy homemade jams and jellies sweetened to your taste. You can use sugar or honey to sweeten. Pomona's Universal Pectin keeps indefinitely when stored in an airtight container. Easy to use, versatile, and comes with directions and recipes in every box. Find out more and where to buy at PomonaPectin.com. Also available at natural food stores and online. Seed Savers Exchange has been saving, preserving, and sharing heirloom seeds since 1975, and today continues to provide those seeds for gardeners just like you. They have over 600 varieties, 
Visit SeedSavers.org to request a free catalog or to purchase seeds online for this year's growing season. That's SeedSavers.org. Protect your plants against damage with a 3-in-1 plant guard and special blend fertilizer. Visit IVOrganics.com. Straight from the farm, fields, and briar patch, Piper and Leaf Artisan Tea is a tea like you've never imagined it. Get our award-winning tea delivered right to your front door and become part of the Piper and Leaf family. Free shipping over $75 at PiperandLeaf.com. Have essential oils always confused you like they did me? Take out some of the guesswork with Simply Earth. The Simply Earth Essential Oil Recipe Box will help you gain confidence and clarity in using essential oils to help make your home toxin-free. Here's how it works. You receive the recipe box with four pure essential oils, six recipe cards, and extras. Then you learn how to use your essential oils while making the recipes created by certified aromatherapists. Clear and concise step-by-step directions. Save money and detoxify your life. I got to make fun products that will detoxify my home while also learning safe ways to use my essential oils. The best part is these oils don't break my budget. Simply Earth's essential oils are 100% pure and come from the best farms from all over the world. Using essential oils to support your wellness doesn't have to be overwhelming. My home is one step closer to being toxin free because I made the wax melts and more with the Simply Earth essential oil recipe box. Visit simplyearth.com to find your recipe box and more. Looking for a non-toxic fly control? Call the Bug Farm, 1-800-248-BUGS, bugs. The Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show is brought to you by the following. Pro Plugger, Dripworks, Waltons Incorporated, Tree Diaper, Janie's Mill, Phylum Bioproducts, Chapin Manufacturing Incorporated, Nature's Lawn and Garden Incorporated, Deer Defeat, Dr. Jim's, Root Maker. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Welcome back to the Garden with Joey and Holly Radio Show. Moments away, Christy Willingham. But first, you got problems with some Japanese beetles? Rescue has the product that can help you get them off of your plants and await and fix the problem and get them out of your garden. Japanese beetle traps, when used properly, draw beetles away from your plants and trees. The trick is to hang them 30 feet from plants that you want to protect. That way, you lure the beetles away from the areas where they could cause damage. And then it traps them. Rescue Japanese beetle traps are the only traps with a controlled release lure that lasts the entire beetle season. Their extra large bag is welded directly to the trap and stays put even when it's full of beetles. And the Rescue Japanese beetle trap is the only trap with a reusable bag that opens and closes at the bottom. If beetle season is a bad one, just open, empty, and keep trapping the beetles with the same trap. You can find all these products at rescue.com. And they're made in the USA. Again, that's rescue.com. Holly, let's go to the hotline and bring in our guest for this week. Christy Wilhelmi is the driving force behind Garden Nerd. Christy believes that gardening un- unifies both physical activity and healthy food choices while providing a grounding, spiritual, and creative outlet. She has dedicated herself to the study of organic gardening and its benefits. She's an author, speaker, and more. Her latest book, Grow Your Own Mini Fruit Garden, just came out this past May. Welcome to the program, Christy. Thanks so much. Uh, really happy to be back, you both of you. Well, we, you've been a, it's been a while since you've had on, had we've had you on the program, so we thought it was a, a adequate time to bring you back, and we thank you for that. Thanks. And, sure. And we we bring people on the program so we can learn from individuals like yourself, as well as our listeners can learn from individuals like yourself, and we would like you to share a very unique thing that you have found out about the benefits of using worm castings around your plants to control aphids. Yeah, it's one of my favorite things. Worm castings is my first line of defense when I see aphids or any other sucking insect like white fly, mealybug, uh, leaf hoppers, uh, because that indicates that the plant is weak. And so in order to fortify the plant and the soil, we put down worm castings to not only does it have a broad spectrum kind of micronutrient gift for the plants and the soil, but it also has this enzyme called chitinase, which is spelled with a CH, like chitinase, but it's pronounced chitinase for those who are, have not really seen that in writing anywhere. And it is 
this, this, this enzyme, chitinase, happens to dissolve the exoskeletons of soft-bodied insects. So it, when you put it down on the soil, the plants will take it up into their systems, and then when sucking insects, a uh, sucking insect starts sucking on the juices of that plant, they take in that chitinase, and as I tell my students, they start falling apart, and they're like, why am I falling apart? And then they leave. So it helps bring down the population, it wards them off, and it makes it a better place for your plants to thrive in, you know, in your garden. Well, and worm castings have a lot of nutrient value, and this is just an additional bonus property to such uh, using worm castings. And you can, can one create their own worm castings, or is it really better to buy like a, a bag that's, that's got 100% worm castings in it? Well, I think that the best way to produce worm castings is if you have a bin at home, because, uh, you know, a lot of times when you buy something in a bag from a nursery, it has to go through some kind of a sterilizing process in order to kill off pathogens and whatnot. And, you know, it's still good if that's what you can get. If you don't have room or the wherewithal to do a worm bin at home, uh, certainly buy the, uh, the bag stuff at the nursery. But if you can start a worm bin, it really doesn't take up a large footprint. So if you're unable to compost, worm binning is, or vermiculture is the best thing you could possibly do. Well, talking about uh, vermiculture, which is a form of composting, composting is easy if you have big piles and equipment to turn it. But many of us are in small backyards with limited space, or we just can't have a big compa- compost pile because of where we live. It could potentially um, invite unwanted visitors. Um, so what are some easy ways to, that we can all compost that doesn't take up a large area and is uh, more secure than a large pile? Yeah, I've heard a lot of from my clients, actually, and my students who've come up with some really clever ways to compost. Uh, Because they don't have room to, like you said, have a compost bin or they're really worried about rats or other vermin who are going to come in and, you know, take over the place. And so what they do is they'll dig a trench or they'll put a hole in their raised bed somewhere and they will bury their food scraps. Now, of course, you have to bury it deep enough, but there's some other things that they do that you can do. You can either, I have some clients who put their food scraps in the freezer and they kind of save it up until they have enough berry. And the process of putting the um, food scraps in the freezer fractures the, you know, it ruptures the cells. So it already starts the decomposition process. So when you do bury them in the garden, they're going to break down a lot more quickly. Uh, other people will put them in the blender, you know, they'll, they'll puree their food scraps and then pour that into a trench and bury it around their plants. And so that's kind of a no fuss way of doing it. If you've got a strong blender, <laughs> and um, or you know, if, if you're planning out your garden and you want to start growing someplace next year that's different than what you have growing now, you can start that compost trench, and then next year it'll be really fertile and biologically active and ready to go. Well, if you do that, you might want to invest in just a specific blender designed for your composting process, possibly. Right. Yeah. I think if you're, if you're careful about what you put in your blender, I, I always, I have one of those really high speed blenders that can kind of take anything, but if you're careful about your blender and don't put things in it that you wouldn't ordinarily blend up, then you're in good shape. Otherwise, yeah, dedicated uh, blender would be good. Well, your new book, Grow Your Own Mini Fruit Garden, was recently published. What can our listeners expect from it when they pick up a copy and what are some unique, oh, a unique tip uh, or something notable that you would uh, want that our, our listeners might find interesting. And if I'm correct, did uh, the book hit number four today? Yes, <laughs> yes, it did. It got uh, it was ranked number four in fruit gardening on Amazon's bestseller list. So, uh, and the reviews are pretty good. I have to say, so I'm really I'm really proud of this book. I my previous work has focused on small space vegetable gardening, and now I get to focus on small space fruit gardening, and so. It really is for people who have even just a balcony or a patio or, you know, a small yard. And it really, it reviews all of the types of techniques that you can use and the options that are out there for growing fruit in small spaces, from fruit trees to berries and even vertical gardening and that kind of thing. So, we, you know, I talk about 
uh, how to choose the right fruit trees for your area with the right chill hours and, um, and you know, root stocks to make sure you're getting a tree that's going to stay small when you put it in the ground or in a container. And uh, how to, you know, grow berries in a, in a small location and keep them from running all over your yard. How to use vertical towers to grow strawberries and things like that. And a bunch of other things that I think people will find uh, interesting and um, unique in the way that, you know, most, most tips or gardening advice for growing fruit trees are geared towards farmers or people with a lot of space or university agricultural uh, endeavors, and they aren't really focusing on the home gardener. So I introduce people to backyard orchard culture and all the pruning techniques that go with it and even some grafting tips for people who want to try that out. Well, and, and that's the thing, you know, to the co- and, the, and the misconception is, oh, you can't grow fruit trees unless you have five acres to do all this. Uh, and, you know, growing up on a farm, never thought of, you know, ever growing a, in a container ever because land was very plentiful until I moved to an urban setting where books like yours teaches a whole nother realm of, of gardening that many people didn't know existed or could be potentially uh, grown in a container. Right. And like the, the comp- I'm sorry, I'm saying the wrong word. The, uh, yeah, I'm blanking. It's not companion planting. It's combination planting where you can plant three or four trees in the same planting hole and uh, they're all in the same family, like say four different kinds of apples or a plum, a peach, a nectarine, and an apricot. And, and they're, you know, their trunks are only 18 to 24 inches apart and you prune the inside so there's nice enough airflow and nice room for them to grow in, but you treat it kind of as a, as a hedge or a clump of a tree. And that way, home growers can get a little bit of fruit from each of those trees throughout the growing season. And it, it's an extended growing season, especially if you pick something that, you know, one variety that's an early, another that's a mid-season, another that's a late-season variety. So you're not getting 400 plums all at once. You're getting a few fruits from all of those different trees throughout the growing season. Kind of cool. That's that's definitely very interesting. So we're talking with Christy Wilhelmy. She's an author, uh, speaker, educator, and she's from GardenNerd.com. Some people might say fruit really isn't expensive or I can get it from the farmer's market. Why would I grow my own? What are some good reasons to start a fruit garden? And what are some challenges one may face when starting that mini fruit garden? Those are both really interesting question because I I feel like all you need to do is drive by a commercial agriculture you know farm and watch what they're spraying on everything and that really for me it's like grow organic and organic fruits are more expensive than if you were growing it at home I think the other thing about growing fruits at home is that you can grow varieties that don't travel well for like mulberries you know they're kind of hard to keep fresh, the so blackberries sometimes, you know, and raspberries, they don't stay well, uh, you know, they don't stay fresh in the, in the refrigerator. But if you're picking them out of your backyard and eating them fresh, they're so delicious. And my blackberry glass in the fridge for a couple of weeks because they haven't traveled 1,500 miles and they haven't been picked three weeks ago and, you know, been trucked across the state. So that's, those are my reasons for, um, for growing fruit at home. Uh, you can also grow things like we have this tree. It's a Mexico native. I'm here in California, in Southern California. And we have a native, it's a Mexico native tree called the loquat that you'll never find in a grocery store because it bruises so quickly and it doesn't travel at all. So the, sometimes fruits that are really interesting can't even, they just aren't even sold commercially. So growing them at home is your only option. So that's one of those things that I recommend people growing fruit for. And regarding the challenges, well, you know, if, if, <laughs> it all depends on where you live. If you have critters of any kind, you're going to have to protect your crop. And that may mean physical barriers, um, you know, protecting each fruit individually, like apples, we use maggot barriers over those. Um, I use bird netting over my berries sometimes to keep the birds away. And uh, for rats, we have to set rat traps and that kind of thing. And that's going to be different depending on where you live. I imagine you experience a whole different set of 
critters than I have here in Southern California, right? Right. Yeah, absolutely. Everybody's got their own own level of uh, problems when it comes to uh, rodents and insects to deal with. Right. And, and it's just a matter of honing in on how to prevent them from getting to your fruit and harvesting when they're ready, you know, don't leave them on the tree or on the bush very long, and then you'll get your fruit. Then you won't. Awesome. Well, we've really enjoyed having you on. Um, how can people find out more about you and your great information? Sure. You can visit gardennerd.com, and that's G A R D E N E R D.com. You can also find us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube in all of those places under Garden Nerd or Garden Nerd One. So, Garden Nerd One on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, no, Instagram and Twitter. Uh, <laughs> Facebook book, is gardener.com. Your book's available <laughs> in all bookstores and on your website? That is correct, yes. You can get autographed copies on my website, and bo- the book's sold everywhere. And, you know, Anywhere books are sold, you can find it. Well, Christy, we greatly appreciate you uh, taking a little bit of your time today, not only to educate Holly and myself, but all of our listeners. Thanks so much. I really had fun. Thank you. And when we come back, it's all going to be about your garden questions, our garden answers. This is the Garden with Joey and Holly radio show. Got a question for Joey and Holly? Send it via email anytime to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. This week's garden tip is brought to you by Yard Glider, the cart without wheels, loads without lifting, hauls more, dumps faster, built to last, and built for hard work. Multiple sizes available at yardglider.com. That's yardglider.com. Proper watering is the key to a successful garden. Inadequate watering can damage your plants by causing the soil to dry up and preventing essential nutrients from being uptaken to the plant to properly develop its leaves or the fruit. Watering deeply multiple times a week as well as shallow watering can greatly enhance the production of your plants. Putting yourself on a water regimen is the key to a successful garden. This week's garden tip was brought to you by Yard Glider. The cart without wheels, loads without lifting, hauls more, dumps faster, built to last, and built for hard work. Perfect for homeowners, arborists, hunters, landscapers. Pull it behind an ATV, a lawnmower, or pull it yourself. Multiple sizes available at YardGlider.com. That's YardGlider.com. Dig planting holes from a comfortable standing position. Step, twist, pull, and plant. Visit ProPlugger.com. Is your dog that's causing dead spots in your lawn? Dog urine can burn lawns and ruin the appearance of your lawn very quickly. Fortunately, our friends at Nature's Lawn has a solution for this problem with their Spotless Lawn product. Spotless Lawn's three-way action helps neutralize dog urine, helps move it through the root zone, and then helps the grass recover. If there's still life left in the grass, Spotless Lawn will help resuscitate it. Visit natureslawn.com and look for Spotless Lawn. That's Nature's lawn.com and look for spotless lawn the water hoop is a portable water sprinkler system that allows you to target water evenly around the root ball of your tree or bush conforms to various shapes for your watering needs the water hoop reduces runoff and saves money visit waterhoop.com make watering easy dripworks provides quality drip irrigation supplies and equipment to gardeners just like you for all your growing needs across the u.s and canada purchase online at dripworks.com We know that you appreciate the value of a beautifully landscaped yard, but tackling such a project yourself can seem way too complicated, right? Bloomin' Easy plants are the answer. Their plants are low maintenance and offer exceptional beauty and color for your yard. Plus, they offer free seasonal care reminders with simple how-to videos tailored to the plants that you choose. With Bloomin' Easy on your side, creating the yard that you've always wanted becomes as easy as plant, water, and relax. Check them out at your local garden center or by visiting bloominteasyplants.com. ShipDrop is a website you can sign up for free wood chip mulch delivery right to your door. For free, ShipDrop connects homeowners and gardeners with tree services who are trying to get rid of their wood chips. You can also sign up to get free logs and firewood. Go to ShipDrop.com to learn more and sign up for a free account. Brought to you by Blue Ribbon Organics, providing locally made organic compost and soil blends for gardens, 
farms, landscaping, and more. Visit BlueRibbonOrganics.com or call 262-497-8539 to find their products nearest you. The Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show is brought to you by the following. Blue Ribbon Organics, Naturally Green Products, Ironwood Tool Company, Easy Step Products, Rinse Kit, Soul Brew Kabucha, Wild Delight, Rikon Vitova, Chip Drop, Bailbuster.com. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Welcome back to the Garden with Joy and Holly radio show. Question and answer time. If you've got a question, send it on over to GardenTalkRadio at gmail.com. We will get an answer to you. If you'd like to talk with us, you can do that by giving us a call toll-free, coast-to-coast, 1-800-927-SHOW, 1-800-927-SHOW. If you want some numbers on that, that's 1-800-927-7469. Holly, let's see what we can get through to the top of the hour. Okay, so they want to know, how do I keep birds from eating my strawberries? Well, there is items called bird netting in which you can drape over said strawberries to uh, reduce the amount of bird activity getting on them. Right, you can you can use the bird netting. That's really the best option. We've never had, when we had the big strawberry patch, if we lost strawberries, we didn't know it. Um, but that, that would be the best option is even if you don't want to drape it over, you can put fence posts and create like a little cage with that burdening. You can get burdening of any size, but that will reduce the, uh, birds getting into your, uh, strawberry patch and, uh, more for you. That seems to be the best solution. Yes. Uh, what is the purpose? You continue to talk about using whole grain cornmeal around the base of your tomato plants. What does that do? And does it have to be whole grain? So yes, yes, it has, it, has, yeah. it has to be whole grain. It has to be yellow for whatever it reason. It has to be yellow whole grain, and you might have to go to an organic food store, or even look online. But an organic food store will have it. Our local grocery, like regular grocery store, doesn't have whole grain um, unless it was sold out, and I just couldn't find it. But everything's yeah. sold out nowadays. Every- <laughs> now. <laughs> Who knows anymore? So, but I do find it the organic food store. So but- the whole grain cornmeal has this beneficial fungi in it called trichoderma. And what happens is that we have we have good and bad things in our soil, and early blight is something that lives in your soil no matter what. And then when it splashes on the leaves of your tomato plants, that's what causes the issue. So the trichoderma and that whole grain yellow cornmeal helps prevent that early blight. It helps, I don't know. It's fight like, it. Fight it, essentially. So what you do is you take it, you put it on the base of the plant, just a handful at the time of planting, and then probably about, what, 68 weeks later? Uh, yeah, f- five to six weeks later. Five to six yeah. weeks later. As you're continuing to trim the bottom of the tomato six to eight inches up and reducing the potential of splash-up, in addition to using mulch, you're putting this cold, whole grain cornmeal on the soil, then the mulch. But at that per- period of five to six weeks later, you can just drape, the, throw the, sol- the, the cornmeal on top of the mulch and it'll work its way down in the soil. Or you can move the mulch back, whichever you prefer. Right. So that is the and, solution there. And it reduces the, 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 it doesn't eliminate, it reduces tremendously the early blight that is getting on your plants. Now, this is not something that we made up. Uh, Master Gardener, Bob Webster out of Austin, Texas, we found this trick about 2014 or so, been doing it ever since. And our tomatoes are as green and as lush at the time of frost as they were the day we put them in the ground. Typically, early blight, it progressively works at the plant. Your leaves all fall off, and then um, you don't have uh, any leaves, but you have full of, you know, stems and fruit on the plant, and the plant's dead, basically. But uh, this works tremendously. Right. So Jenny wrote in, she said that last year on her carrots, she got what she thought was uh, carrot rust fly larva. And that's what she thinks it looks like. She forgot to take pictures. Her mom said it could possibly be a, fun- fungus, a fun- fungus. And she's listening and- to the show via podcast out of Iowa, so we appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Um, and then she, but she didn't have pictures for us. She lives in Iowa. She wasn't sure. She said she she did some research. She couldn't find anything about this in Iowa. I've never heard of it really in Wisconsin, but I feel like as the climate kind of changes and things change and pests pests change pests move around and things like that, it could be a thing. So or it could be a, become a problem. So the thing is, is that if you can, you can determine if the carrot rust fly is going to arrive. Typically, you will do this in May. You will take these yellow sticky traps and put them near your carrots. 
And then when it catches this fly, you'll know. And the other thing, when you thin your carrots out, don't pull up the uh, carrots that you're thinning. Simply cut the tops off. This will reduce the fragrance of carrot in the air and reduce the potential of those flies coming in and finding your carrots and doing damage to them. This is a big problem over in the UK. So okay. So if you, if you feel you have this carrot fly, you can plant your carrots a little bit later. Or fall carrots. You can do fall carrots. Yeah, it's uh, 60, 70 days. You got them going. And the cool west, coolness of it will actually benefit the carrots. Or you can do succession planting. Right. So, like, say you plant you plant one week and the carrot rust fly larva happens. If you plant it, like, every week after that, it may only attack, like, those one plants, but not the other ones. The sacrificial plants. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, with that, we are out of time, and we thank you for yours. Did you miss any portion of the program today? Want to revisit it? You can do that by going to our parent website, the Wisconsin Vegetable and clicking on the Season 5 tab at the top of the page, or simply send us an email at gardentalkradio at gmail.com, and we'll send you the link to this program. Do not miss the program next week. We'll be going over five growing tomato tips throughout the season so you can have a successful plant all the way up to frost, as well as canning prep. And our guest will be author and radio host personality Stan DeFreitas will be with us and will answer your garden questions. So until next week for Holly Baird, I'm Joey Baird, and we will see you in the garden.